Welcome back. Welcome back uh, to this next session of Kingdom Exploration. And we are going to be discussing tonight uh, this next session, Session 10B. And it's the expression and extension of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And it talks about the transfer of kingdom citizenship and allegiance. Kingdom transfer of citizenship and allegiance. In this, season, in this session, we will recognize that there is a need to make a transfer of kingdom citizenship and allegiance at a heart level by an act of our will. We must choose to transfer our allegiance away from the prideful self-rule of the kingdom of darkness. We must choose to humbly submit to the administration of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. If a person does not make a change in their allegiance at a heart level, they remain a citizen of the kingdom of darkness. As a natural born citizen of the kingdom of darkness, they remain in bondage to the law of sin and death. The citizens of the kingdom of darkness are destined for judgment and the wrath of God on the day of the Lord. God's merciful and gracious free gift is his kingdom. I want, to, I want you to see that the kingdom of darkness is ruled by the law of sin and death. Okay? Darkness. And we're going to get through this in just a moment. It's ruled by the law of sin and death. Okay? Now the kingdom of God is ruled by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And they are in opposition to one another. So we will go through that over and over again. But I want you to realize that you can only be in one kingdom or in the other. But not in both. Now I want to deal tonight with the expression, extension and establishment of the kingdom of God. Now the expression of the kingdom of God is like looking at a tent. Now you see, I brought me a tent here tonight. I've got this tent. And the expression of the kingdom of God is like look, looking at a Bible. And I'm saying this Bible is, represents the kingdom of God. And oh, this in this bag, it represents a tent. So, but using that illustration... Does it do me much good? Does this do me any good on a rainy night? Will this do me any good closed and unread when I'm sick and people are perishing? The answer is no. So then what I need to do, I need to extend that kingdom of God. Now what that means is I need to start opening that up. I need to open up that thing and I need to unpack it. See, it's all taped up here. Those manufacturers, they've done such a good job. My goodness, I should have probably looked at this before I started. But you've got to unpack it. Man, they did a good job. Unpack the message of the kingdom of God. Unpack it. Yes, it's in there. But have I unpacked it? Have I taken it out of the box? Have I tried to unwrap it? Have I tried to extend it out to see... What, how it works together. I said, oh my goodness, what a mess. Look at this mess, this thing called the kingdom of God. So then, I want to see just how extensive is it. And I start unraveling it. Oh my goodness, this thing just goes on and on. Look at that. And I go out like that. Then I look at I say, well, how in the world can that protect me? How can that keep me Safe. So I have to look at some of this stuff that's, that have fell out of the things. Surely there's got to be more. And I start finding the pieces. I start finding the parts that go together, that work together. Because it doesn't work by itself. It works in harmony with others. I need to walk in partnership. I need to untie this knot. Amen? 
And I need to start putting these things together. And oh my goodness, look at that. They're already knotted together. They're already joined together. Well, how do I put them together? You see, I have to learn how to be fitly joined together. Each part supplying what is lacking in the other. There is a message about the expansion of the kingdom of God. That this tent that is extended out here, then I learn how to put all the struts in it so that it can be extended up and I can see that there's an expansion of that kingdom. Then I come around. There's so much here. And on another day, I will assemble it. But it wouldn't do much good there. But you see then, there's another aspect. I mean, if I did put that tent up, if I had the tent up there, some of you have seen these little pup tents, and I put it all together. You know what? I can pick that thing up and I can move it from here, and I can move it to there, and I can move it to here. It's not established. It's not solid. It's, what, what does it take to establish? It takes a peg. I have to put a peg in the corners of the, the tent to hold it into place. The expression, you see, today the Holy Spirit is preparing a prophetic porthole to present, penetrate, permeate, and perpetuate the kingdom of God in the earth today. The, the Holy Spirit is preparing a prophetic portal to present, penetrate, permeate, and perpetuate the kingdom of God in the earth today. We start by the expression of the kingdom of God. Oh, let me, let's see, do I have, yeah, I got everything, okay. The expression is the presenting of it. It's the declaration explaining the hope which lies within us and which is to come upon the whole of creation upon the return of Jesus of Nazareth. And a reasonable, responsible response to the claims of Jesus Christ. There is a reasonable, responsible response that we can expect if we appropriately, adequately, and accurately represent the claims of Jesus Christ to a human being. My friends, God created man to dwell in a garden God created man to desire kingdom fellowship. It's in the heart of man. There is an extension. When I, when I pass this thing out, when I lay this out and I go in different directions, I said, oh my goodness, I didn't realize from that little tiny box. Look at how big that thing is. And I start saying the extension of it is it penetrates into other areas. I've got to move things aside. It penetrates. It pushes back. And it shows the fullness of the extent and the effectiveness of the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God. You see, it goes so far this way, so far that way. That's the jurisdictional extent of my aspect of the kingdom of God. There it is. I roll it out. So I need to understand that the extension is the penetration. How far? How far do you want to penetrate? When he said... Ask me for the nations. Ask me for cities. Ask me for people groups. How far will your penetration be? What are the jurisdictional extents of the manifestation of the kingdom of God in and through your life? Then there is the expansion. The expansion is that when you start setting it up, and guess what? When this thing's laying on the ground, people walk right on by and they don't even see it. Bushes all around it, it hides it. But you put that thing up and make that dome, people can see it from a distance. That's what God wants with his kingdom. He wants an expansion demonstrating by erecting reproducible patterns in and through the lives of other disciples of Jesus and his kingdom. See, that's how we manifest the expansion. We permeate the culture by reproducing reproducible patterns in others. We, it's not enough to make disciples. I don't want a disciple program. I want, to deci I want to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. It's not enough to have one generational disciple. Every seed multiplies. Then there's this establishment. 
Establishment is the perpetuate, to perpetuate producing generally, generationally sustainable and reproductive kingdom communities of redeemed men and women sharing their lives together in mutually reciprocating submission and equality that is marked by holiness, wholeness, humility, and honor. That's what God is doing in the earth today. Today, God is producing generationally sustainable and reproductive kingdom communities. It's happening. Families are coming out. Families, I'm not talking about families in the natural. I'm talking about kingdom families that are beginning to come together at a heart level. Each of these stages relates to the engagement of the jurisdictional extent of the kingdom of God in and through our lives at any particular time. This is that one of your lives. Where, where are you in this? Where, where are you? Are you, just a, are you just a showpiece? Oh, I got a Bible, but it's closed. Or do you have your Bible and it's open and you're, you're showing them that this is where my jurisdiction is, this is where my faith base for grace is, and you're showing them this jurisdiction or what about your life? Have you expanded your influence? And have you established generational discipleship? And then, my friends, have you put in the pegs? Have you put the pegs down? The peg. Now, Isaiah 22, verses 22 to 23, is really interesting. I'm going to just kind of digress just a little bit here. It says, the key... Of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open, or loose, and no one shall shut. And he shall shut, or bind, and no one uh, will open. I will fasten him as a peg. And that's something. God's going to fashion him as a peg in a secure place. And he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. Then we see in Acts chapter 15, verse 16, he's quoting Amos 9, 11, and 12. He says, After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Now, I can go all over the place on this tabernacle of David. There's a lot of things that I would like to talk about regarding the tabernacle of David. I think one of the ones that has just really pierced my hearts recently is that David, David really captured God's heart. He said, God, you want to be with me. You don't want me just to come to a temple or come to the... At that time, the, the tabernacle was in Shiloh and you had to go there. God, you want to be in me. You want to be with me. This was God's desire in the garden. And this will be the... Read the last chapter of the book. God comes down and dwells among them. That's been God's heart. That's the ultimate, uh, eternal tabernacle of David. But the house of David also speaks to the tabernacle or the tent or the dynasty or family of David. One of the messianic titles, Jesus of Nazareth, was referred to repeatedly by the citizens of Israel during his earthly ministry was the son of David. He was called the son of David, not the son of Joseph. Identifying him as the Messiah. Acts 15, 16 is quoting Amos 9 11, which speaks to a specific day in which God would restore the tabernacle or identity and dynasty of David in a sight of the nations of the whole earth. Now, I believe, I believe two events have happened in the last year that have actually brought this about. On December 6, 2017, the President of the United States, let me, let me write this down so everybody can see this. So if you want to write to me, you can December 6th, 2017, the President of the United States of America declared publicly that the United States would move their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. 
thereby recognizing Jerusalem as a legitimate, historical, and eternal capital of the nation state of Israel. Now, what this was, this was... Okay, on December 6, 2017, the President of the United States, probably without question, one of the strongest nations in the earth, and perhaps one of the most powerful men in the earth, he declared publicly that the United States would finally move the embassy from Tel Aviv, the city of Tel Aviv, into Jerusalem, thereby recognizing Jerusalem as the legitimate, historical, and eternal capital of the nation-state of Israel. Okay? He did this in contrast to international law and the United Nations. So in every respect, he was at odds with a lot of the world. Now since then, about 11 other nations have also declared and moved <coughs> their embassies. This actually took place prior to the 70th anniversary of the rebirthing of uh, Jerusalem, uh, Israel. And, and so we see that before the 70th anniversary, the, uh, the, the uh, embassy was actually moved. Okay, that was in the spring of May of 2018. Now in July, in July 19th, July 19th, 2018, another event took place and the governing body of Israel, the Knesset, passed the nation state law which divined Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people for the first time in modern history. Now both of these have to do with identity. Together these two public actions decisively reestablish the identity and dynasty of David as it relates to the city of David, Jerusalem, and the nation of Israel. And so, Amos 11, which speaks about in that day, a singular day, I'm going to do this, and that's exactly what happened on both December 6th and July 19th. The identity of Jerusalem as the capital and the nation of Israel as being a Jewish nation, honoring God with Jewish holidays, the Jewish uh, Torah, came into pass. That day. And because that day, that is why I believe that released a season of days that is found in Amos 9.13, which is the harvest we were speaking about before. It released the inauguration of Amos 19 on a global scale in real time. Now, let's look here. I want to look at Matthew 6, 18 to 19 again. I know we looked at this last year, or last week. It says, and I also say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. We talked about that last week, so I'm not going to go over it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, and whatever you bind on or shut on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose or open on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, the better structure of this sentence would be that whatever has been shut up in heaven, you will be able to shut up on the earth. And whatever has been loosed in heaven, you will be able to loose on the earth. And this is the result of the work of Jesus when Jesus placed his blood upon the altar in heaven. Look with me at Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. He who opens, looses, and no one shuts, and shuts, and binds, and no one opens. So here we go, clear back to Isaiah, 
and we bring it right up through Matthew and right into the book of Revelation, and all together through this, Jesus is identifying with this key of the house of David. To receive the keys of the kingdom of God is to also receive the identity of the kingdom of God. To receive the keys of the kingdom is to receive the identity of the kingdom. Am I willing to identify with God's kingdom? Now, if I put the kingdom of God into heaven, then my identification is in a mythical blue heaven. Someday I'm going to be up in heaven. But if my identity is in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is upon the earth, then I have a different identity. It's a now identity. The church throughout the whole earth is growing in their identification and understanding of the kingdom of God in the earth today. Possession of the keys is the result of receiving the privilege of knowing experientially one's identity in Christ Jesus and the kingdom. So it's not only the kingdom, but the king of the kingdom is Jesus. Okay? So our identity is in Christ and his kingdom. I think there's something, I, I look at Ephesians. Somebody open up Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Let me make sure that's right. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. Anybody, loudly. Let the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Who are the inheritance of God? We are. We are. We are the inheritance of God. Ask of me, Jesus said, God, the Father said to Jesus, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. We are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the earth. Amen? Do you see yourself as God's inheritance? You are God's inheritance. Now listen, there are only two spiritual kingdoms in the earth. Either we are in one or we are in the other. The tent graphically illustrates this point. We are in the kingdom of God, or we are out. We are entering in, or we are leaving out. There is no gray area. Now, the United Nations today has 197 nations, or excuse me, the United Nations has 193 nations. There are 197 in the world today. But there are only two spiritual kingdoms. There are not five. There's not 10. There's not 25. There are two. There's the kingdom of God's Son, and there's the kingdom of darkness. We are in one, or we are in the other. We are born into one kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, but we must choose to shift our allegiance to the other kingdom and enter into that kingdom. We are born again when our heart allegiance is transferred from one kingdom to the other. If there is no intentional transference of allegiance at a heart level, then we are not authentically born again. Repent. You are no longer your own. You have no self-determination. You have no self-justification. You have no rights. You were once a slave to sin, and the fruit of that was death, but now you have been bought at a price of Jesus' blood, and you are a slave to God, 
and you do not own yourself. Therefore glorify God in your body because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You do not have a right to self-determination. My friends, if you demand the right of self-determination, fine, go to hell. Because that's the result of a demand of self-determination that refuses to repent. We talked last week about the idolatry of intellectual understanding before I would obey and how the Father withheld the revelation of the Son and the Son withheld the revelation of the Father as a result of that idolatry. Today, our churches are filled with people who have confessed four spiritual laws, but they have not renounced self-worship. They have not renounced their own narcissistic self-love. In fact, they came to the altar to make their life better, to get rich quicker. That's not a gospel that has anything to do with the kingdom of God. Now, in Matthew 10, 1, it says this. Matthew 10, 1 says this. And he called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Jesus of Nazareth conveyed legal authority. I don't care how you feel. I don't care what you think. Jesus of Nazareth conveyed legal authority. It is a legal matter. It's not a feeling matter. Okay? In Matthew 10, 7 to 8, he says, As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. All of this is pre-cross. This is all pre-cross. Pre-death. Pre-resurrection. This authority pre-ascension. This, this legal authority was on the basis of previous old covenants. Which God had made with men. I'm sorry friends. Those covenants are still in place. That power and authority is still on the planet. It has never been retracted. It's never been retrieved. Now, I want to just say there is always a potential, there is always a potential nearing proximity of the kingdom of God within the life of every individual. But there's also a, nearing, a potential nearing proximity of the kingdom of God into every community. Now, I want you to see, we have seen and understood, we have seen and understood, listen carefully to what I'm going to say, because this is how we get around taking cities. If you want to take cities, we have seen and understood that casting out demons was out of people. But it is equally and perhaps better understood as being out from the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God which you are operating in. What is your inheritance? What is the realm of your relational responsibility? What is a part of what God has given you to have dominion over? What has God put you in place for and asked for as your inheritance? What are we asking God for for our inheritance? And in that realm, we have authority to cast out demons from the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God that has been given to us. We must choose to abide in the freedom from those things which oppose the legitimate authority and jurisdictional reign and rule of the king of glory. See, 
We have to fight. You have to contend. We just want to walk right in, waltz right in, and start healing the sick and doing all this, and we don't think we have to fight. Listen, those demons have been there for 2,000 years. They have had their ground staked. People, the, the, read the history of the, Mount, of, the, of the Indians of the Pacific Northwest. All this land has been dedicated to demon gods. And we need to go and we need to cleanse it. We need to take it back. Anyway, I don't want to get off on a spiritual warfare seminar. But we need to understand that the kingdom of God, the jurisdiction of the authority of the kingdom of God is more than just personal. It's more than just my family. That's why Jesus came in and he said, he said to the cities, if the miracles that were done with you had been done here or there, they would have repented. They would have repented. They, they would be alive today. But you, it will be worse for you. Why? Because they chose to maintain their allegiance to demonic host. But we need to give our cities an option. We need to give our cities a testimony. We need to give our cities an option to choose the kingdom of God. That's what they did in Acts chapter 16 when they turned the world upside down. But it resulted in riots. It resulted in being imprisoned. It, well, it resulted in being stoned and taken outside of the city and left for dead. Are we willing? Anyway, let's go on. That's a little bit too heavy for us tonight. I want to look at John 3, 3 to 5. Are you able to tell the time on that? Because I, I didn't. 7.56. Uh, no, I mean, how, many, how long I've been going? Uh, uh, 28 minutes. Huh? 29 minutes. Okay. In John 3, 3 to 5, I want to just look at something. I want to begin introducing you to something to kind of shock you a little bit. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, that unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He is not talking about going to heaven. He's not talking about going to heaven and seeing the kingdom of God. He's talking to Nicodemus about seeing the kingdom of God now. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He is not talking about going to heaven after you die. He's talking about entering into the kingdom of God now, in this life. And I will show you scripture after scripture after scripture with the same see and enter, see and enter, see and enter. We must also believe and we must also receive. We must also enter. There's a whole series of these. But as long as we've mythologized the kingdom of God into heaven with the Catholics have done and the rest of us have believed in it, then see, we're not looking for the kingdom of God here. We're not looking for the authority. We're not looking for the power. We're not looking for the majesty. We're not looking for the glory to be manifested. And so we have to unpack 1,800 years of tradition. My God, what does he say? To whom God willed to make known, Colossians 1.27, whom God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, now. Don't put on there, Christ in you, the hope of glory, after I die and go to heaven. But that's what we do, don't we? Christ in you, the hope of glory, if I make it all the way to the end, and I, I, I'm a good man, and I get all the way to the end, and I've been faithful, I didn't backslide, and I didn't have, I didn't go running around, I didn't go get back to my drunkenness or whatever, then maybe I'll go to, go to heaven and be glorious. No, my friend, Christ in you, the hope of glory, now. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you have been disqualified. Christ Jesus is in you. There is no mention of going to heaven after you die. This was not a part of the Jewish apocalyptic theology of that era. Now listen, you have to understand. The message of the kingdom of God... You must understand this or you just totally miss it. The kingdom of God message was from the apocalyptic Jewish teachings. 
There was a group. At the time that Jesus appeared and John the Baptist appeared, there was groups of those who were believed in the apocalyptic vision and testimony and prophecies. And they talked about the day of the Lord. They talked about the judgment of God. They talked about the coming kingdom of God. Jesus did not create the message. He adopted the message and then made it alive and brought it to pass. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus about seeing and entering the kingdom of God now while he is still alive. If being born again is essential to being able to see and enter into the kingdom of God, as Jesus has explained in Nicodemus, then as such, being born again might be considered one of the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So you have Christ in you and you in Christ. He says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the uh, self-ruled will of the flesh, but according to the administration of the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death that rules in the kingdom of darkness. I've added a few things in there, but I'm sorry. Colossians 1.27 We read earlier, God has made these known to us, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. This continues to be the singular, eternal purpose of God, to dwell with men upon the earth. Simply look at the beginning of the book and look at the end of the book. Look at the first chapter of the book and look at the last chapter of the book. You have Eden and God walking with men in the beginning and, and all of that, and you have the tree of life, the river, and God walking with men in the New Jerusalem at the end. They're both the same. Anyway, let me continue on. We're going to transfer in the kingdom of God. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. I'm going to read out of the Living Bible. I don't normally do that, but I have a purpose here. Always thankful to the Father. He Right, I'm in the middle of a sentence. I know, I'm sorry, Mrs. Woodrum. I'm starting in the middle of a sentence. I'm always thankful to the Father who has made us fit or qualified us to share in the wonderful things that belong to those who live in the kingdom of light. And you should, ought to, you, you should get this scripture. Those who live in the kingdom of light now. For he has rescued us. He has rescued us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and brought us, conveyed us, moved us, transported us into the kingdom of his dear son, the son of his love, who brought, purchased, acquired our freedom with his blood and forgave our sins, all of our sins, all of our sins, all of our sins. Underline all of our sins. He took away our sinful nature. Oh, my friends. Eternal life refers to both eternal life. There are two things, a couple things we need to get squared away in our thinking Someday, we need to understand the difference between eternal life, eternal life, and immortal life. They're not the same. Immortal has to do with the duration of time. Eternal has to do with the quality of life and a duration of time. Immortal life. There's a lot of creatures that are immortal, my friend, but they're not walking in the eternal glory of God. They're demons of hell that are immortal. I don't want to argue about that. We'll get on that some other day. Eternal life is a quality of life. Immortal life is a duration. One is time and one is quality. Jesus always talks to us about quality of life now and the quantity of life into the ages to come when the Father of glory is dwelling among men upon the earth in the new Jerusalem and a new Eden. See, the, the earth is not going to be annihilated. The earth is going to be made new. And the new Jerusalem is going to come down upon the existing Jerusalem and the tree of life and the rivers 
and the branches, they're going to come. The Father is going to come and dwell upon the earth with men. That's after the thousand years of making the whole world new. Anyway, i got to get off of that. Let me go and look at Colossians chapter 1. In every version of Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, we see there's a present tense understanding and experience of the benefits of the kingdom of God to be reasonably expected. The qualifying factor is always the work of the Heavenly Father, not the person. The Father has qualified you. The Father has qualified you to lay hands on the sick and cast out demons. The Father has qualified you to raise the dead. You do not do it by works of righteousness. The Father qualifies us to be partakers of His divine nature and share in the benefits of His love. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. It says, As His divine power has given to us all things, all things, somebody say all things, all things, all things that pertain to life, and godliness. We are not lacking anything, friends, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now remember we talked about the definition between world and earth? There's not saying you escaped the earth and went to heaven. You're not escaping the earth, my friends, and going to heaven. You're escaping the world system of philosophies, thoughts, and ways of behaving. You are escaping the world's kingdom of darkness. It's not about going to heaven after you die. It's about bringing heaven to earth and living in that divine nature. You've escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Self-consciousness. Self-rule, self-determination, self-seeking, senses of entitlement. These are all elements of the fallen human nature which is to be replaced by the nature of God in Christ Jesus. These are all elements of the narcissism of self-worship and idolatry. I'm sorry. We've escaped the corruption that's in the world. Let me give you that list again. And this is just a partial list. Just to give you self-consciousness. When I become conscious of myself and what others think about me. Self-rule. When I make determination, self-determination, I'm going to choose where I go, what I go, who I go, and what I do. I'm the one who rules me. Self-seeking. I want a, my own aggrandizement, my own pleasures, my own joys. A sense of entitlement. This drives me crazy because Christians all the time come to God with a sense of entitlement. Like, God, you owe me. I've been good. We pray for sister so-and-so who was such a good Sunday school teacher and now she has cancer. She was a Sunday school teacher for 30 years. God, you owe her by healing her. Now, we wouldn't say that, would we? But that's the attitude of our heart, isn't it? No. We, he owes us nothing. He has already given us everything. Nothing is in debt. He is not indebted to anyone. He's already paid that price, my friends. Listen. Luke 12, 31 to 32. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek it first. And do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Then look with me at Luke chapter 22, 29. He says, And I bestow or appoint upon you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed or appointed one upon me. He is not talking about in heaven. There is a canopy of grace in the time and the place of appointment. When you know who you are, when you know that where you're at is where God has put you, when you come to grips with that, you will understand that there's a canopy of grace in the time and place of appointment. God has chosen where you would live, when you would live, how you would live. He says, what did he say to Paul? 
He says to Paul in Acts 22, 10, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things that are appointed to you to do. God has a season of appointment upon us. And we are so busy trying to go to heaven after we die, earning our way up there, that we don't understand what we have been appointed to do here. In the very first lesson, I think we talked about how God has fashioned your hearts individually in consideration of the works that he has prepared for you. That is to be found in um, Psalms 33, 15. Psalms 33, 15. God has fashioned your hearts individually in consideration of the works that he has fashioned to you for you to do. There's a great difference. What does that mean, he fashioned your hearts? He fashioned your hearts. Well, let's open it up. I'll kind of close with this. That's good. What does it mean? I'll just read it right out of Psalms 33. 33, I'm going to start in verse 11. And we're going to close tonight with this. I'm going to start in verse 11. I'm in Psalms 33, 11. I have that written down. I'm going to start at 11 and read through 15. You see it says here, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. That means the counsel of the Lord began before forever started. The plans of his heart to all generations. The plans and the purposes of his heart began before all generations began. And so continue to all generations unto this very day. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people who he has chosen as his own inheritance. We just read that verse, that we are the inheritance of God, the saints. Look at verse 13. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling he looks. From all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. One another rendering, the Woodrum rendering, says he fashions their hearts individually in consideration of the works that he has prepared for them from before the beginning of time. God has a purpose. God has a plan. God has put you in place at the right time, at the right place. And everything you need to fulfill God's appointment is in you. There is no lack. There is no added. This is a day that the Lord has made. Because the Lord has made it, it's good. Because the Lord has made it, it's full. Because the Lord has made it, there is no inadequacy. There is no lack. In the day. There's no inadequacy in the day. For us to curse today, to say I had a bad day, I don't have bad days. I don't have any inadequate days. I don't have any insufficient days. Because it's a day that the Lord has made, and the day is good. We need to change our very thoughts and our very acts. Anyway, don't let me get off on that. I better stop now. I want to close for tonight. What? Well, I, I, I need to finish the recording and then I'll do questions. So hold those questions for just a moment. Next week, I want to begin with 10C. And I want to examine the religious legalistic obstructions against entering into the kingdom of God. Jesus became angry with few people in his lifetime but he became very angry with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the lawyers and the scribes because they did not enter in to the kingdom of God and they withheld those who were entering in from entering in. And it made him mad. So we're going to examine next week, we're going to finish this and look at the legalistic, the religious legalistic obstruction against entering the kingdom of God that are erected by institutional religious systems of thought, practice, and ideology. So, join me next week, and we will continue this, and we will continue to see ourselves set free and made free in the grace of a living God. Amen and amen. Thank you.